<laughs> I, I, I think it's on now. And uh, we have colleagues ar around Australia, I think, connected uh, by video, so welcome to them as well. Uh, Christina, uh, really terrific to have you here. Christina, a lawyer by background and now with very wide responsibilities in the Energy Agency. And uh, uh, we in Australia, especially in difficult times lately, have drawn inspiration from the German energy transition uh, when, when uh, the political realities that we're working through uh, get us down. And, uh, it's great to be able to hear from uh, uh, from our German colleagues uh, and others in, in, in Europe and in other countries about the progress that they're managing to make and that keeps us going at times. Uh, and uh, Christine's going to talk to us about the, uh, the, the where, where Germany is at with the energy transition. Uh, much poorer renewable energy resources than Australia, but already providing a third of its electricity requirements uh, from uh, renewable energy. But as we saw in the, the conference of the uh, German-Australian Energy Transition Hub, or I guess about a month or six weeks ago, uh, when we had uh, colleagues here from German research institutes, government and uh, industry, there's general acceptance in Germany uh, that we're headed towards a zero emissions uh, world economy or around mid-century, hopefully a bit before, uh, and that's shaping uh, how German industry looks at a lot of issues, and uh, uh, that perspective is tremendously valuable for us, uh, and I think that, w that uh, w we can use that perspective in helping to educate uh, uh, Australians who haven't yet faced up to some of the realities about things that we can do. So we'll start with Christina just giving us an overview of where things are at and where they're going uh, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll then uh, move into discussion. Uh, I might ask a, a few questions and then we open it up uh, to the, the whole meeting. Christina. Well, first of all, thanks a lot for welcoming me here and giving me the opportunity to, to talk to this audience. I've been in Australia for two days now. I've participated in, in the Insights Forum of ARENA and I've been able to talk to some people in Canberra. Um, what has extremely surprised me is um, the, the level of coherence in the discussion we are having in Germany and the discussions and the research um, activities that you are following in Australia. I'm aware that at least at the moment on high levels the Australian politics is maybe um, not as much on track as um, the German policy. On the other hand side I also have to admit and I think that's something that honesty requires to say that we in Germany on a political level are pretty good at setting objectives, ambitious objectives. We are maybe not as good in implementing, designing and in implementing the instruments necessary to reach those objectives. And um, maybe this is partly also a reason for the fact that up to now there is pretty much support everywhere for energy transition. It doesn't hurt. Um, if you get down to measures that might be unpleasant for one or other groups, you never know how this is going to impact the development. Now, this being said, um, I just shortly summarize the, the basics of, of energy transition in Germany. We in Germany have had a, a rather strong green movement ever since the 70s, uh, uh, which was born out of opposition to nuclear power, which we have had and which we still have, but will phase out in 2022. The green movement has also taken over the subject of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, global warming, and has carried that into the the 
midst of, of the German population. We have a support ratio of 80 to 90 percent still in Germany um, regarding energy transition and becoming climate neutral by 2050. I don't think before actually, but 2050 is a, is a set target. We also have, um, and this is, this is a consensus among all democratic parties with the exception of one. We now have a right wing, extreme right wing party in the German federal parliament and many of our state parliaments, the so-called alternative for Germany. They accept that global warming is taking place, but they don't accept that it's man-made. So they are not in favor of energy transition. Um, they are gaining support for reasons other than um, climate questions. They are gaining support in view of their xenophobic attitude towards um, immigrants in, in Germany, unfortunately, but they are not being considered as um, um, responsible enough to take place in any kind of government. So as, as for the time being, unlike in other European countries, um, those people are not part of the decision-making bodies in Germany, fortunately. Now, as I said, we, we have um, a very high ratio of, of support. Um, we have um, an abundance of objectives. Our objective regarding greenhouse gas emission was a reduction by 40% until 2020. We will not make that. Um, the next step is a reduction by 55% in 2030. We probably will make that, and then by now 95 has been fixed only recently by, by 2050. How shall we get um, to a reduction that is steeper now than it has been for the past 10 years roundabout? Um, because we are only now at minus 27 point something as compared to 1990. Uh, um, not minus 40, but minus 27.9, 31% in probably 2018. Uh, um, uh, um, one will be phasing out coal in Germany. Uh, we are phasing out nuclear until 2022, and it has been decided to phase out um, both black hole and lignite uh, fired power plants by 2038, but in three steps. So the first step will be taken in 2022, the second in 2030, and the third in 2038. Nuclear still makes up for 11% of our uh, power supply. Coal, all in all, makes up for 35 something. When the first third of coal plus all of nuclear is phased out in 2022, we will lose more than 20% of our production capacity in one year. Um, at the moment, we are a net exporter of electricity at the end of the year. Of course, in the course of the year, it's sometimes we're sometimes importer and sometimes exporter, but net, we are exporter right now by about 10%. Um, means that the gap of around 10% that we expect to have in 2022 will need to be covered somehow. Partly it's going to be covered most probably by imports. However, um, imports must come from countries with which we have a connection. We have recently built, or we are still building partly um, a high voltage connection to Norway because what we want to import, of course, is green energy, water powered energy. However, um, within the European Union, our connections are also in the direction of Poland, which is still over 80% coal. Um, and on the other hand side to France, which is still like 70% nuclear. And that, that's a bit of a discussion, of course, in Germany, saying, well, we are phasing out, but we are not really 
you know, substituting uh, um, the, the right things. This is one of the reasons why we are um, still, we are working hard on, on stepping up the share of renewable production in Germany, which as you mentioned is more than 30%. It's actually um, 39 right now. And our plans are 65% by 2030. It's not, it sounds nice, it's not that easy because um, even though we have so much support um, on a, as a matter of principle for energy transition, when it comes to windmills in the backyard, the enthusiasm is modified. <laughs> um, so just recently, um, it has been decided to impose restrictions on the distance between windmills and settlements and the distance is one kilometer. Now that might, might not sound like a lot to you, but Germany is a small country with over 80 million inhabitants and there are not a lot of places where you can say there's one kilometer around without settlement. This is going to um, be a challenge for our increase in, um, in renewable energies. And there is another challenge related in a way to this, um, well, to this attitude, um, which is where there is space and also perfect conditions uh, for wind, the north of Germany is a non-industrialized area. So there we have a lot of electricity um, and potential for much more offshore, uh, uh, but there are no grids because in the past uh, um, the production was close to the consumption centers, which are in, in the southwest and in the south of Germany, in Baden-Württemberg, North Rhine-Westphalia, and in, in Bavaria. So what we would need to do is build um, transmission lines from the north of Germany to the industrial centers. And also there we have this kind of, of NIMBY discussion preventing um, the grids to be built as fast as, as, is, as is necessary. The grids were supposed to be built above ground, but we have taken, had to take the, the political decision to go underground with most of them to reduce position, making it expensive, one, one has to admit. So these are um, some, some of the challenges that we face. And there is also the question of, um, of course, volatility and intermittency of, of renewables. Um, we are very much working on the same subjects that ARENA is, is working on Interalia. How can we, uh, um, what can we do with the grid to raise the capacity and the resilience of, of grids without necessarily building new lines? Um, talking about storage options, batteries. I think you're further on the road with batteries here in Australia than we are in Germany, but we're starting to, to experiment with that. Pump storage. A new issue, very important for us, and I think very much of a common interest uh, with Australia being a storage through power to X, power to heat being one option, but power to hydrogen being the, the more relevant one because it does not only enable us to store excess electricity when there is some in a huge gas storage system that we have, but it would also enable us uh, by methanization, for 
example, or by turning it into power to liquid, to use existing infrastructures and appliances in a way that is very compatible with the needs of people. I mean, you could electrify transportation you can elect to a large extent you can electrify um, heating to a large extent but that requires people to change habits uh, to invest in in buildings and the more change you demand the more likely you are to um, confront opposition at a certain stage and power to x and to l is a actually a rather affordable um, and very becoming alternative to direct electrification in, in many cases. Yeah, I would stay with that and I'm open for further <laughs> questions. Uh, as you say, uh, as you say uh, Katrina, uh, the issues you're facing uh, uh, intersect with the issues that we're facing. There's some different special challenges here and uh, we don't have quite the NIMBY problem in Australia as a whole that, that you do. There's plenty of parts of Australia that welcome wind and solar, but some parts that don't. Uh, the densely populated farmlands is not quite so happy uh, uh, about wind, um, but uh, uh, that's that's a much uh, tighter constraint for you than for us. But but the challenges of, of intermittency of using the grid better to economise on use of the grid to get pa power from uh, rich renewable energy regions to the regions of industrial and urban demand, they're, they're very much the central problems here. Uh, we're facing a, a very big problem now of uh, our old grid being in the wrong place for renewable energy and uh, uh, of course, the uh, the old incumbents uh, like things the way they are, and uh, uh, have all all along the way. Uh, ever since I made some recommendations on a different way of planning the grid in 2008, uh, the established uh, energy industries had every reason why uh, there should be no support for uh, uh, the grid in any other place. And gradually, we will. Change, change that, but, it, but it's a very big challenge. Um, the, uh, in Germany and, and in Australia, the electrification of, of industry and transport is going to be a very important part of the decarbonisation. Uh, so uh, the challenge is even bigger for us both than simply decarbonising the existing grid. It will, it will be decarbonisation of a of a larger power system than now. Uh, could, would you like to say a little bit about how, how you see the, the challenge of increased electricity demand as uh, through decarbonisation of transport and industry and, and how that affects the, the future as you see it? I... I think I, I should start with the fact that um, we would not be able to cover the additional demand if we would continue living the way we do. We have, for example, 47 million passenger cars in Germany, which means that um, almost every adult owns a car which usually stands around uh, like 23 hours a day, but people still um, own it to drive one hour a day in, in average. Um, we have buildings, existing buildings, that are not in such a perfect state of um, insulation of of energy efficiency and the refurbishment rate is rather slow due to the fact that up to now we have only um, taken the measure to support refurbishment but not to regulate the energy efficiency in existing buildings. So right now we use about 
570 terawatt per, per year in Germany. And if you add 47 um, million battery electric buildings plus uh, 20 million heat pumps, then you would have to uh, have about five to six times um, the, the electricity production right now. It's not going to work. What will happen? Um, as far as buildings, um, we are now starting the honest discussion that we'll, we will need to regulate energy efficiency in existing buildings. It's a difficult um, discussion because it concerns people very personally and one will have to go about carefully with that, but there's no way around it. Um, we will make, um, for example, gas firing, but also driving a combustion car more expensive uh, by introducing a carbon price also in that respect. We already have an emission trading system, but it's only for industry and, and energy sector. So consumption of fossil energy will become more expensive, must become more expensive. We will probably step by step restrict the use of individual cars there where public transportation is an alternative. Um, no specific measures decided yet, but are in discussion. So we expect that, um, in, I'm not, I can't give you a number, but instead of 47 million cars, we might just have a third or something. We expect to reduce our demand on energy by a half until 2050. That's the official objective. And then it would be possible to cover what is left in terms of electricity demand by what we produce plus what we import. So uh, is, that a, is that a reduction in energy intensity of 50% or an absolute reduction of electricity? Prim primary energy um, consumption. Yeah, uh, including, uh, very important point, so forgive me pressing you on it, but that includes it, en primary energy consumption in industry. Yeah. And Germany it does. has it does. big steel industry, uh, a lot of primary. Uh, it does. Well, this is one of the areas of potential cooperation with Australia that we discussed in the conference uh, a month or two ago, uh, where uh, we could pr provide uh, renewables based zero emissions. Uh, metal, uh, to where the early stage, the energy intensive process is undertaken here, where with an abundance of renewable energy and where the iron oxide or aluminium oxide or, or silicon oxide comes from. Uh, in, in German thinking, is there some prospect of, uh, uh, of reducing the uh, the, the energy needs of German industry by uh, importing the early stage uh, uh, production of, for example, metals uh, and reducing demand for metal in that way. So that Mercedes-Benz can still be competitive, in fact, become more competitive by using uh, low-cost metal. The, the discussion I'm familiar with um, right now is um, very much focusing on, on the use of hydrogen to uh, um, decarbonize steel production. And uh, um, the largest German manufacturer who emits, I think, 37 million tons of um, CO2 per year right now, uh, um, is experimenting with uh, um, substituting coke uh, by hydrogen in the production. Um, I'm also familiar with the discussion um, centering on, on a very different technology, um, not green hydrogen or um, steam reforming hydrogen with the CCS, uh, but pyrolysis. 
which would permit to um, crack up water into hydrogen, but also hard carbon, which could then be used, for example, in, in the car industry. These are the, well, the issues I hear being discussed, but I must admit I'm not an expert in the metal industry. So if you, you use very large amounts of hydrogen, that's going to require a lot of energy to make the hydrogen if you're making it. Oh, we are counting on you. Absol oh, okay. No, absolutely. Okay. Okay. <laughs> very much so. But, in, but, import, but your thought, first thought is importing the hydrogen rather than importing the metals. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, lots of questions there. Uh, who'd like to... Simon? I can draw a cloud. Um, <laughs> uh, outside commentators, uh, thank you, Ross. Um, outside commentators have uh, often say that it would be much easier for Germany to achieve its goals if it had kept nuclear going longer. Um, and uh, and on the other hand, I hear I hear um, comments that that actually a big big impetus for the energy and uh, uh, the, the social license for it comes from. That denuclearization. So, I'm interested in you in where the discussion is in Germany. Uh, is there is there regret that the phase out was too fast, or is uh, are, are people um, uh, okay with the speed? People are absolutely okay with the speed. Um, there is a broad consensus, even I would say broader consensus than that regarding global warming that uh, nuclear is not an option. We have been having very difficult discussions about storing nuclear waste, and there still is no, after 20 or 30 years of discussion, there still is no site where we could um, finally store nuclear waste in Germany. It's being moved around, it's being exported for, uh, uh, being worked over, but then it comes back to Germany and we still don't know what to do about it. And people know that. Um, this is one reason. The other reason is uh, security concerns. Um, there has been a um, European um, survey on how safe um, nuclear power plants are. And basically, if you honestly look at that, um, every intelligent drone drone could get at you with such an old power plant as we have and most other European member states have. So now, for those reasons, completely irrespective of climate considerations, um, nuclear is not supported by most Germans. Two unrelated questions. Oh, my, my name's Colin Long. I work on just transitions for the Victorian Union movement. Two unrelated questions. One, and maybe uh, Ross, you can uh, comment on this as well. What are the implications of the zero marginal cost of generation for renewables for liberalised uh, electricity markets like certainly exist in Australia? I'm not so familiar with Germany and the, so the wholesale price. And second, if you're going to import a whole lot of our hydrogen in whatever form, you're going to need a lot of shipping. Have you done any work on zero carbon shipping? As far as um, the costs, the running costs of renewable is um, concerned, we have seen that push gas-fired power plants out of our merit order. However, our coal-fired power plants um, have so low operating costs that uh, they still stay in the system. So, in fact, um, the fact that our renewable share is rising in the course of the year have has been to the advantage of renewables, of course, also to the advantage um, of coal plants, but to the disadvantage of gas fire plants. And we will need um, gas fire plants when phasing out nuclear and coal, uh, desperately need them. So now we have um, 
a discussion of how to incentivize uh, small flexible gas-fired power plants, investments in them, as the price signals right now are not there for, for such investments. Uh, um, the second question centered on, on, on shipping. Yes, there's research being done, but not by, by the German Energy Agency. I was invited to answer it as well. Um, I, I don't think that uh, the zero marginal cost uh, is, ex uh, is actually a, 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 an insurmountable problem. It, it is associated with high volatility of price, which uh, uh, if people had confidence in the stability of the system would provide quite strong incentives for uh, investment in peaking assets of one kind or another, peaking gas or pumped hydro or demand management uh, or, uh, uh, or batteries. Uh, the, uh, well, there, there is a problem of uncertainty about how the system will evolve. For example, the discussion of, uh, of the very big pumped hydro project in the Snowy. Uh, if that was present, uh, two gigawatts with 35 hours of storage uh, or many more gigawatts with still quite a lot of storage, uh, then uh, that, that would reduce the volatility of prices quite a lot and reduce the business case for other investments. So we've got something we have to work out uh, about how that will work in future. I've got a suggestion in, in my book, uh, Super Power, about that. But, uh, but 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 um, what we we do need to think about how we provide incentives for the right amount and the right sort of uh, peaking investment in this environment. On shipping of, of hydrogen, that, that's quite a big challenge. It's first of all uh, an, an economic challenge. Um, the hydrogen. As, as Christina would know, doesn't liquefy until you're just about down to absolute zero, minus 253 degrees. So you use a huge amount of energy to liquefy it. You've got to liquefy it before you put it into a ship. And hydrogen is such a small, first of all, a small atom, and then it's the smallest of molecules, and, and it will seep out between the molecules of standard steel. So you need special materials in the shipping and needs also to be able to withstand the materials extremely low temperatures and great pressure. So uh, shipping of hydrogen is going to be expensive, which leads a lot of people to think, well, the low cost route will be to convert the hydrogen into ammonia, uh, which is another cost, uh, both energy and capital cost to, to convert it into ammonia, but the shipping cost will be much easier and you don't have to liquefy it. Uh, so that will be sorted out commercially it may very well be that the low cost path is is uh, ammonia but it won't be low cost but then you could use co more conventional bulk shipping to uh, to take it but it's, it's because of the very high costs of uh, moving the hydrogen either as a liquid or as ammonia that that uh, I've come to think Christina that uh, it's going to be much cheaper uh, your your downstream processing industries, manufacturing industries will be more competitive if you if you import the energy uh, intensive uh, uh, metal rather than not not advanced metal, not the Mercedes Benz, just the the iron the iron that's the start of the process. So that that's going to be much cheaper to transport than uh, than the hydrogen. Well, uh, well, first of all. Um, in, indeed, um, liqui, li, liquefaction, liquefaction. Thank you. Liquefaction um, is is an option, but it's energy intensive to an extent that might even be difficult to um, cope with by a country which has which has such a potential in renewables as Australia. Um, I don't think that ammoniac will, will be a solution, but what I hear is that there are, alter, uh, or 
what will be one of the solutions. But uh, what I hear is that there are also other research activities going on, in particular by NEDO in Japan, regarding alternative um, substances which can take up um, hydrogen and release it uh, when when it arrives. I'm not a chemist and I've never understood how it works, but it sounded kind of exciting. However, no matter what you do, it's costly. And uh, um, we as Dena have done a study on which countries would be, let's say, most interesting for us to address for hydrogen export. And the result was that an existing gas infrastructure would be extremely helpful. So um, we're looking at Russia again, which we already look at for um, oil and gas. We are looking for Kazakhstan, for example, which has perfect wind conditions, uh, plus also the possibility to attach to existing um, gas infrastructure things like that. And that to, to our um, mind is a bit of a disadvantage with view to Australia because you're so far away. And the other thing is that you have your natural markets here in Asia, which will pay more or less every price. That's the impression we get. And uh, um, so it would probably for you, distances are lower, your customers are already your customers. For a long time, it would be more convenient for you to export your growing share of green hydrogen to Japan, Korea, for example, than, than to Europe. And Japan and Korea are even poorer in renewable energy resources than Germany. Exactly, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Korea. Uh, well, the mayor of uh, Seoul came to see me a few years ago and he had a commitment to zero emissions for Seoul. And uh, having made the commitment, uh, he had quite a challenge because that 23 million people live, nearly all live in high rise, uh, there's just no flat land uh, around Seoul and not much uh, yeah. for, for wind. Yeah. So, so that, that's going to be part of the, 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 the story. Uh, any, from CSIRO. Um, yeah, in relation to that liquefaction energy, Ross, that uh, I think it's uh, currently 8 to 12 kilowatt hour per kilogram of hydrogen, and potentially that can be brought to 7 kilowatt hour at best sort of situation. So I think I was going to ask the question that German, Germany had, I think, the largest liquefaction plant in the 90s. So which part of hydrogen energy supply chain Germany is focusing now and which organization are working in that respect? That's the question to you, Christina. Mm -hmm. Germany does not have a hydrogen strategy as yet. Um, I talked to, to Mrs. Reeves, Reeves um, the day before yesterday, who is developing the um, Australian hydrogen strategy, which I think will be published today or tomorrow. Quite exciting, looking forward to that. Uh, um, our hydrogen discussion, so to say, is actually pretty recent. Uh, um, for some time, it was a controversial discussion based on the assumption that the hydrogen we need will have to come from Germany. And that meaning that we would need much more renewable energy than we already need by normal transition, um, which in turn resulted um, into an opposition to renewable hydrogen at a stage of energy transition before maybe 80% renewables in the mix. It was acknowledged that at a rate of 80%, we would need to have hydrogen as a storage medium. Uh, but before that, for other purposes, for, for decarbonization, no. Uh, um, only recently it has been accepted that we will need to import because to use it for other appliances, not only for storage and stabilization of the grid, but also for consumer sectors. 
that's as far that as, as the discussion is going right now. We have pilot projects um, regarding green. We have a lot of pilot projects going on in Germany. Actually, I think 30 about, but most of them really uh, low scale. I think all in all, they add up to 35 megawatt. Uh, um, there are bigger ones in planning. We have one by Shell regarding um, green hydrogen on site for refinery purposes. We have one larger one by Audi, Power to Liquid in Werlte. Uh, um, but, well, no, nothing industrial um, scale yet. <laughs> Christina, I'm interested in uh, what's happening in the other European countries. Are they on a similar trajectory as Germany? You mentioned Poland, for example, having still 80% coal. What's happening around you? Yes. Um, the um, energy and climate policy is um, also within the competence of the European Union. And there are European objectives, both for 2020, for 2030, and for 2050, which have been agreed unanimously by, by the European Council, so the um, Committee of Heads of um, Governments. However, um, at the same time, the European treaties acknowledge that um, every member state is free to decide on its energy mix, uh, meaning that it is acceptable that France opts for nuclear, that Poland opts for coal, and that Germany opts for <laughs> renewables. <laughs> under the condition that common efforts lead to reaching the common goals. But that does not mean that um, every member state carries the same burden. There is um, the so-called burden sharing directive, which attributes contributions to uh, um, greenhouse gas reductions specifically and individually to member states taking into account their different backgrounds. In Germany as one of the member states, um, like Sweden for example, that has to carry a comparatively large load because we can. And then there are others, in particular the new member states, which still carry their east history both in terms of economy and uh, um, and energy production with them and they they carry less and can only work that way you need to have the the support of the population in our member states and the state of mind is not equal in our member states so there must be a, a, a finely tuned burden sharing <laughs> I think I can do without a microphone. Thank you for your presentation. Oh, you still want me to use it? Okay. Is it switched on? Thank you for your presentation or your talk. Uh, we've got people interstate who might not hear you without a microphone. <laughs> right. I've got two questions. Uh, methanation, is that being done commercially in Germany? And to what power level? Uh, um, you mean... Um methanation of, of hydrogen. Well, capturing uh, CO2 from the atmosphere and hydrogen by hydrolysis, by um, electrolysis, mm, yeah. and then mixing it with natural gas. Um, I'm afraid I can you, cannot tell you whether we have any air capture um, research projects when, I don't know. I, I thought I the Fraunhofer was doing some work on it, this. It is possible, but I'm not aware okay. of that. And the second question is Passive House in Darmstadt. To what extent is that influencing German building regulations today? Yeah, very much so. But you said there are no regulations as yet. Oh, oh no. Um, there are very ambitious uh, regulations for new buildings. 
and getting getting more ambitious every two years round about. Uh, um, we have a high building standard, but only for new buildings. That's the problem. We have a, a, a real clash, almost passive house standards for new buildings and uh, like 1920 level for, for existing ones. Thank you very much. Hi, Anne Kallis. I'm a legal academic at RMIT. Uh, this is all, and I followed the German energy transition for a long time. It always strikes me as being comparatively top down. And what we've just talked about, as well as the kind of, you know, we're phasing out big town, we're building big infrastructure. So going into the future, what do you think is the role of the individual consumer in this transition beyond, we need to hope that they all kind of keep still. I like, you know, this idea of consumer empowerment um, and where does Germany sit there? Things have been changing very, very much in that respect. Um, I, I have learned that Greta Thunberg is also a name known in Australia. She, <laughs> she, she is Swedish and um, probably one of the best known uh, names in, of a young girl in Germany. We have uh, Fridays for Future, have had Fridays for Future Fridays um, for the past half year with growing numbers. Um, my office is close to the ministries on Friday afternoons. I can't cross the street because it's full of young people. And um, that has extremely changed public awareness. It has brought the discussion of what can we, how responsible are we and what can we do? Taking it out of television shows or public uh, politic circles to, to the kitchen table. And uh, um, what I witness is that, for example, I have two stepchildren that eat vegan. And the reason being that um, they are opposed to the methane um, of cattle raising. Now we have quarters in Berlin where you can only buy vegan eyes, uh, vegan meals, etc. So I think um, it is it is about to change. And there is now something like, how shall I say, CO2 bashing. <laughs> when you, like me going to Australia, flying two days, staying two days, flying two days. <laughs> 